the idea of tonight is that Gideon is basically Gideon is going to show his work on HIV and AIDS in Africa, a selection of his work, um, and I'm going to interrupt him and and question and question him along the way if I see any. Uh, uh, as I see things that seem to be worth pursuing. But as we're such a small crowd, maybe you uh, feel free to interrupt yourselves. Um, uh, in case you don't know, a very, very quick potted history of Gideon's work. Um, started working as a documentary photographer for in, the, in South Africa in the 1980s. Got involved in doing news for about five years um, in the period uh, of the kind of, uh, well, the most violent resistance to apartheid within South Africa. Gideon was one of the main um, news photographers. Became a magnum, um, uh, what was the word? Nominee. Nominee. Was it a nominee? Yes. Okay, a, a magnum nominee um, during that period, uh, uh, at which point he moved to London and I think had quite a difficult time, uh, which is when I, I met you. Maybe I was something to do with that, I'm not sure. Um, but in any case, um, uh, you then joined Network Photographers where you were one of its leading, um, leading photographers working principally editorially. Um, you're now working independently on your own projects as well as assignments, and your work is also represented by Corbis. Is that right? Um, yes, so, sort of. Very good. Gideon, tell us about what you've been doing on AIDS, in Afri AIDS and HIV in Africa. Okay, I mean, firstly, just to um, follow from Chris, I mean, it's such a nice small group here tonight, so please interrupt. Feel free to throw things at me and questions at, at, at any point. The less of a sort of a lecture this is, the, the, the more comfortable I feel. Um, I've, you know, I've, I've given various talks about my work over the last couple of years, and I, I'm, I'm, I guess, just a little bit bored with the format. Of, you know, I've kind of what I've normally done is I've begun at the beginning with my work from the sort of early 90s and sort of followed its, its chronology up till the present day. And I, I thought, as an as experiment tonight, I'll try to turn that on its head. And what I'm going to do is kind of begin at the present, and I'm going to work backwards. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start with. Some of my the kind of the most well, it's not quite the most recent work, which I have done some work just in the last couple of weeks. But this is a project which I did at the sort of um, end of last year. I, I did a project with UNICEF in the Sutu, looking at the issue of mother to child um, transmission of HIV. Do the lights go down at all? Um, um, Thank you. Yeah. So, so, th so this is a baby born to an HIV positive mother in South in the Sutu, um, and in this case. The mother had access to PMTCT. That's the prevention of mother-to-child transmission treatment. So, so that's access to, to the drugs, which would help prevent the virus from, from being passed on. Um, this work was published in The Guardian, but I think in perhaps its most interesting format, we made a series of small films. And, I, and I'm, it's part of my kind of dialogue with Chris. In the last couple of years, I've done a lot of multimedia. When I photograph, I often record sound, and I've made various presentations which have been a combination of words, sound, photographs. Um, and why don't I cue um, you to show, show, the, show, the, show the first of those little pieces? I was three months pregnant when I found out I'm HIV positive. I was so shocked and I didn't know what to do and who to tell. I go home and I spend the night crying, the whole night crying. I was very happy when I saw my baby. My baby is very healthy. She's HIV negative, she's fat, she's strong. She's a, a beautiful baby. I want to help other people be free of what I have experienced. That is why I'm in that program of Maras to Maras. We tell them 
to prevent HIV passing to their babies by advising them to take the drugs. <laughs> very very sick she's hiv positive and she's not feeling very well i feel shame i just ask him god what we did because i don't understand the same family the mother the child and again my sister is positive i'm not happy <laughs> The name of my baby is Tonolophas, which is blessing in English. I call it a blessing because I think it is a blessing in the family. We are going to see more blessing in, in the family when she's growing up. And I think God will protect her, not being infected with this serious disease, HIV. She likes to play very much. Blessing, is, is, she's a special baby. The way she does things, uh, she's very special from other babies. <laughs> so I think prevention of HIV to the child is very, very important because we need a new generation who are not HIV positive. That is my dream. I don't have any questions about about that. Um, just to say, you know, it, it was made partly with the idea and the intention before we went, went to, to make things which could work in the kind of YouTube environment, short short pieces, um, which kind of convey a kind of a message. And in a way, it's about making a tool which was used for UNICEF for both kind of education and fundraising. Are you... Sorry, there's a question there. But I'll ask the first one. Are you... Um, do you see yourself as a journalist then or as something else? Um, I see myself as lots of things. I mean, I think... Um, certainly not a conventional journalist. OK, well, just to say... So this is made very much for, with, with, with the idea of making... Sh so we made a series... I mean, actually made a series of seven short films, each the story of a different woman in, in Lesotho. Um, I'll show you one other short one right now um, before we move on. I took my child for its six weeks after birth examination. That is when I discovered that I was HIV positive and so was the child. It is very painful when I see my child sick because I can never know what is really wrong with him. My other children love him a lot. My children get very upset when the little one is sick and they always want to help me with the baby. Every morning when I wake up, I sweep outside my house I wash my sick baby and I give my sick baby medicine. I have to hold his hands because he doesn't like taking the medicine. He always cries when I give him medicine. So I have to hold him tight. He now knows the bottles. When I bring the bottles, he starts crying. I know that I am going to have to give my baby medicine all his life and with time it becomes easy because it's something that I do every day and I know when to do and how to do it. Since he has been taking the medicine, I have seen his life change for the better and he's not very sick the way he was before he used the medicine. I love my baby very much. Because of his disease, he has become very close to my heart.
show you a couple of, just a couple of photographs. And I, I, what I'm doing is I'm, kind of, I'm going backwards in time. And I mean, what I want to show you is I, I've kind of every year for the last seven years, I've, I have done a kind of a major publication of my ongoing work. I, I'd say I'd call it my ongoing documentation of the landscape of HIV and AIDS in Africa. Um, and I've, I've had a, quite an interesting collaboration with The Guardian. And in different locations in The Guardian over the last seven years, they have done a major publication of the work. And I think it's been a very interesting long-term collaboration with one, one newspaper, and something which I certainly hope will continue at least for, for, for 10 years. Um, so th this work is about memory boxes and different organizations working with um, different, what they call kind of memory tools, ways to deal with some of the kind of psychological consequences of HIV and AIDS amongst children and others. Um, so a few pictures from the, from the memory box work that I did um, of different people affected, you know, children mostly affected by the issue. Um, this is a program in the south coast of South Africa which wor works, does workshops with kids where they paint these boxes and in a context where children haven't got private space, it's often a place where they can keep photographs, orphans can keep photographs of um, family members, the, the parents who've, who've passed away. Apparently I can ask questions, it's just the audience can't because oh. of the microphone oh. issue. Oh, sorry, oh, you can ask questions. Can you just explain exactly how the Memory Box project works? Okay, well, it's complicated and, and I could do a whole talk, in fact I have done a whole talk about the Memory Box project, but basically there are a variety of different organizations and it's, it is quite controversial working with different kinds of memory tools from, the concept began in Uganda with memory books. Um, and Created by whom, for um, whom? The organization it was actually begun at a point when a lot of women were dying in Uganda. And um, um, it was, if I remember, it was um, NACOLA, which is the National Council of uh, a Women's Organization in Uganda, be began memory boxes, memory boxes as a way for parents who are looking at, at, at death, in a sense, to leave memories and leave something concrete for their children. Um, and the idea has mutated and it's appeared in different forms and in different contexts right. across Africa, different kinds of projects. But it, it's seen in some ways of, as a way, in a context where kind of psychological services might not be available, to help children, help families deal with, with the consequences of being orphaned, of dealing with sick people and their families. Um, I, I haven't actually chosen very many of those photographs to show in this presentation. And these are just a few of the... Of the, of the more interesting ones. Does that help you? Thank you, yeah. Um, um, it was really just a snippet of that, and I, I'm moving back another year to, I think, quite a major body of work. I did, in fact, over a couple of years in a community in the Eastern Cape of South Africa, a place called Lusiki Siki, um, where I looked at um, a program which was established by MSF South Africa to bring antiretroviral th therapy, antiretroviral medication to a remote ru rural area. And essentially they set up this project to prove a point, to prove that medication which at first people were dubious would work in that kind of context, to bring the medication to a remote rural community in, in Africa and to show how it c could work really well. So this is a kind of an installation which I kind of did with them, which is called I call 99 Faces. Um, and these are 99 people who are basically still alive because of the medication. Um, the 99 people on antiretrovirals, they, a few of the kind of nearly 2,000 people on the medication within that community um, who all kind of chose to be part of this project and chose to, to, to be photographed. Um, I, we actually, I actually made a poster for for them. In fact, at the end of the program, at its conclusion, we, we made a poster, um, which, which that, that was the, the basis of. And, and now I'll show you some of, some of the, the kind of individual stories which were part of this project. Um, this is the story of Nozomile Ndara, who um, is one of the women who's in, in the poster. And this is actually one of my favorite images. Um, this shows her three months after she started antiretroviral medication. Um, um, she was so ill she could hardly move, and three months later she's able to kind of walk the four miles, which I kind of struggled to keep up with her, to the place where she collects water. And I mean, I, I struggled to, to lift that bucket myself. 
and she so easily, so comfortably was able to kind of lift, lift it onto her head with a baby on, on her back. Um, so, I mean, for me, it illustrates, you know, the way she was able to kind of come back from being really ill, um, thanks to the medication, um, and a few pictures from her life. Um, in the time I was there, um, she chose to take her children to be tested as well. She was concerned that some of her children might be HIV positive. Um, so she took her four children to be tested, and that's a counselor explaining the test to her children. And those are the tests. And you can see that in each test, there's just a single line, which means that the child is HIV negative. And if there was a double line, it would, would have me meant that they're HIV positive. So that was really kind of pretty good news. Um, there's a kind of ironing her HIV positive T-shirt, which um, we'll see more of later. But um, it was, it was, she, she was getting ready to go to a protest. And I think, as I so often find in photography, the photographs of her taking part in the protest are not that interesting, whereas the preparation and the ironing of the T-shirt, I think, is, is actually much, much more interesting. <coughs> um, there's her with, with her children cooking in the evening. Um, and she's displaying over there the, the th triimmune, the, the three-in-one ARV tablet, which, which she was taking. Um, and this is, I think, one of my favorite stories, and I think raises some interesting questions also around representation. This is um, Nompilo, Nompilo Mazuza. And when I first met her, she was an extremely ill young woman. Um, she had a CD4 count of two which meant she had al almost no functioning immune system. She also was suffering from MDR, from multi-drug resistant TB. So she's someone who really kind of seemed to be almost dead, and I began photographing her at that point. Um, and over the next couple of years, or a few months, I photographed her in, in a variety of situations. Um, here she's actually going, that, that container is the MSF clinic in, in Losikisiki. So that's um, on her way to the clinic with, with her children. Um, that's did, did you photograph her first before she began the, the, the program? Yeah, yeah. It's in, the first, in the first pictures were at the start. Um, or I, I photographed as she was starting, I began. I mean, I, I actually I, I began the, the initial work I did in the CQCK, I did as part of a National Geographic assignment to try and do that. And I, and I went to the, to the project, and we began with a few people who were just starting their medication in that, in that week that I was there. So she was one of the people who was starting. Um, and she sort of slowly, slowly recovered. And this was, in fact, two years later. And she was still kind of ill and struggling to, to deal with her, her TB. But, um, and that's her children. Her children kind of began helping her take the medication, bringing, bring, bringing the, the drugs to her every morning. Um, and this is jumping forward a couple of years. Yeah. And that was taken last year. Um, and I mean, uh, it's, it's a, there's a whole discussion about, just kind of going backwards, about representation. Because, I mean, I guess that's the kind of, this is the kind of photograph which some years ago people like me were accused of sort of being victimologists and vultures for taking of kind of portraying people living with AIDS as, as victims, as being powerless, as people heading for death. And the changing circumstances and the changing, you know, I think it may, it may have been appropriate then, but I think the fact that I was able to follow her t and follow her story to a situation of kind of comparative health changes the whole um, landscape and kind of environment. I mean, with your me more recent work, have you been accused of the opposite? Have you been accused of failing to show the severity of people suffering with HIV? Well, I mean, to be honest, I, 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 it's a question I've been asking. I mean, maybe not the severity, but maybe it's a question I've sort of been asking myself as whether, whether I have... Because I think at various points in my career, and you'll see some of the black and white work earlier, I was quite severely criticised in different kinds of contexts. And I, I did really try and take it on board. And I, I tried to find a way of telling positive stories, try to find ways to engage in different kinds of ways and looking at different ways of kind of representing people. And um, 
I mean, I have been questioning myself to some extent, saying whether am I not asking the difficult questions? You know, am I trying to be too positive? And 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 certainly in some of my most recent my most recent work, which I've done, I have in a way set out to ask some of the more difficult questions about why, you know, why is you know, despite the fact that the ARVs are there and there are some successes, why AIDS is still being transmitted at such a horrifyingly high rate in parts of Southern Africa, you know, and the huge problems, you know, and I think complacency needs to be challenged and difficult questions need to be asked. And I'm not sure if I, if I am doing that, really. I mean, isn't it the case that for at least two or three years, <clears throat> your work, the kind of thrust of your work, the mission seemed to be to promote the success of ARVs in Africa, where they were being used, where those programs needed rolling out, where massive funding was needed to make drugs available to huge um, numbers of people, and that your job was to promote that. I mean, that I, I certainly is. I mean, I, and you'll see from the works, some of the work, some, some other, other work I'll show you shortly, is definitely, I think that is the case. I was quite self-consciously moving from being a, I suppose, and there, there was a, a movement from being a more conventional photojournalist, documentary photographer, to being a kind of activist photographer and engaging. I mean, I was very strongly, and I still am very strongly engaged with an organization called the Treatment Action Campaign in South Africa. And I think there was a very tough, there was, there was a street fight happening in South Africa, which thankfully is over now. Um, I'm sure you all know some of the background with you know, a government and a president who was in denial about the problem and appalling things happened and a lot of people died who shouldn't have died and I think it was an appropriate moment to be kind of, I suppose, to be more of an activist than a photographer and, um, I mean I, I think some people I know, some picture editors some people who really admired and supported my work in its early days in this black and white phase have expre d expressed disappointment in the kind of progression and the movement of my work, and they said, "Well, I've moved away." You know, they I've, have s expressed an opinion that I've moved away from being a powerful moving photographer to being something, someone who's more didactic and, as they've said, kind of more boring. Um, so, you know, th those I think are questions and things which I do take take on board. Um, are you now saying that you're dissatisfied with that? Well, role uh, as, a, a, as, a, as, a, as a propagandist and a pro promoter of ARV? Well, I, th I think if I have a role going into the future, it is to challenge, to keep on digging, to keep on, keep on plowing things up. You know, I don't, I, d I don't want to s become a comfortable propagandist for anybody. And I think, I, I, you know, I think some of my more recent work probably will, will make some organizational people not very happy with, with, with you know, and... and um, I, I'm, yeah, I, I, I would like to c create, ch c continue charting, I suppose, an independent path where I'm asking, as I, suppose, as I said before, asking a tough question and charting my own route and not necessarily being anybody's tool, anyone's voice piece, mouthpiece. Um, and, and, and perhaps in some of my other work, as, uh, work as, I, as I go forward, is, is maybe, you know, to do work which is pushing the kind of creative boundaries for myself as well, you know. And I don't know, we'll... we'll show us some more pictures. Show some more pictures, okay. Um, a, a few more Lusiki Siki stories. This is the story of Zamo, a, a young boy who also began treatment in that week. Um, he was just seven, and in fact the same age, age as, as my child when he began treatment, and he was, although he, doesn't, he was pretty ill, and showing a bit of his life. And that's him sometime later, kind of, you know, well enough to go back to school and do well in school. And this is um, Norm from Aneko, who, when I went there in the first week, she was the person who really most moved me, and I, I really had a vision of photographing her then. She was really ill, um, and that maybe, you know, some months later I'd be able to come back and show her going back to school. She was f just 15 years old at this point in time, and... Um, Sadly, you know, she began the treatment, but she was too ill, and she died a couple of weeks after I, I took these photographs. So she was the person who didn't survive. Um, who commissioned these photographs? Um, it was initially commissioned by National Geographic, um, but I went back there independently. 
uh, I did two trips to National Geographic. I went back there a year later um, with kind of some support from The Guardian, and I went back there another year and a half later. Again, just I was in South Africa, and that was self-funded. So I've done four trips so far. Um, this is a, a family portrait which I, which, which I took. Um, in fact, this was taken the night she began her treatment. Um, and I, I had bought some candles as a, um, as a sort of gift. And it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, behind the scenes, I had a bit of an argument with National Geographic about this because they chose this, this picture. And um, I mean, this was a constructed portrait where I used the candles. And they had the impression this was some kind of World AIDS Day candlelight commemoration event. Um, and, and I did, I was quite, there was a mistake. They, they chose this picture, and this, this was used in the magazine. But um, they weren't very happy with the fact that it was a constructed posed photograph as opposed to a kind of an event of some sort. But, the, you know, this was, the, the whole family had gathered there. In fact, I, 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 when she took it, began taking a medication, I photographed the event, and I photographed her taking the medication. Then I saw that the whole family was watching me behind my back, and I'd, I'd kind of missed the photograph because the family watching was really more the photograph than her taking the medication. And this was a kind of, I saw that, and I kind of constructed this picture after that. Um, and I, I've, and just showing you my process, over the years, there were various, part of the challenge and part of the sort of task in my kind of ongoing engagement with The Guardian is sort of to keep the audience engaged. And that's always been a challenge with HIV and AIDS. And it's probably a, a complaint lots of people and lots of journalists have is that the story doesn't change. How do you keep the, you know, the story's terrible, but you, there's a danger of keeping and telling the same story over and over again. So I feel a pressure for myself in some extent in order to perform and deliver something different for The Guardian to keep on changing format, keep on exploring different ways of telling the story. And um, it's a series of a bit of some work I did, and I think this is really kind of in 94, where I was working with a kind of a panoramic camera, telling different kinds of stories, a lot of them around children and AIDS. And this is a, you know, an orphan-headed household in Mozambique. Um, this is a family of orphans, again, in Mozambique. In fact, two sets of cousins who were walking to school. I mean, in this situation, I followed them home from school, and I didn't realize it was about a five-mile walk. Um, so I did manage to kind of take a couple of, I think, quite interesting pictures, and then I spent a lot of time just struggling to keep up with these kids. Um, and it's actually, it's, it's kind of creatively, for all kinds of reasons, of color and it's one of my favorite pictures. Um, that's a, you know, a granny taking care of two orphans. Um, it's a school in Uganda, which, I mean, that's the kind of basically the, the, the one class, year one class. Um, it gives, gives a sense of the overcrowding. There was one teacher teaching this class, and they estimated that just under half the class were orphans. Um, There's a region which has also been very affected by, by, the, by the war in the north. Um, and that is a, just a, a condom demonstration. And there's a whole discussion about photographs of AIDS pre prevention, but I think any photographer who's worked in this area has, has probably got a, a, a suitcase load of photographs of condom prevention events. Um, and um, again, that's a, a picture of a, a TV ward um, in the middle of the night in, in Malawi. Your point about trying to keep an, the audience engaged, is that, was that your rationale for this, the format that you chose, this very uh, just, cinematic? Uh, just, um, just part, that was partly that. And, it, uh, and I mean, it, it was a progression from what you'll see next, but we were kind of going backwards. So it was a progression in, in time from I had a year where I did a lot of work with full 360-degree pan panoramic image, imaging, and we, which we're about to get to now. But that was, and to be honest, I'm not sure if it was a total success using this format, um, but it was part, that, that, that was part of what I was trying to do, was find different, for, and it, 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 to some extent, uh, what photographer, photographer David Goldblatt, who I admire a lot, I mean, I, I showed him some of the work, and he said, Gideon, you're just jumping around, finding different formats to, to tell the same story. So you know, I think that is, you know, I'm kind of, I suppose, showing you some of my successes and some of my failures in this whole process. I mean, I think I produced some interesting images. I'm not sure if it works. I think there's some great pictures, but you still are giving the impression, as David Goblet said, that you are doing, approaching the same story from lots of different uh, uh, formal resolutions. Yeah, I think, and, and, and I think there's certainly the danger of kind of repeating myself in different kinds of ways. 
Um, and I think that is the challenge of sort of keeping going with a story like this over so many years is I don't want to keep on doing the same thing or telling the same story over and over again, but uh, perhaps searching for different ways to to do it. And, you know, um, and, and this is a scene um, outside a hospital in, in Malawi. The, the, these are kind of what they call the guardians. Patients in the hospitals, they, they, they move in with... Um, caregivers who, st- who, who, who stay there and care for them in the hospitals because, you know, so, so, so they were cooking for themselves and for the patients. Um, it's a scene I, I stumbled upon outside the hospital, which I, which I found really quite striking. Um, okay, so moving into the next format, this, um, in, in fact, this was in 2003, and this was in a way at the hi- at a point at the height of the engagement in South Africa, the, the fight for treatment. Um, I, I um, was in the circumstances. I, I, I had just got involved with, with an agency called Corpus. At the time, someone called Brian Storm, who was directing Corpus at the time, was trying to promote and inc- encourage photographers to get involved in, in multimedia in different ways, encouraging us to record sound and explore different kinds of multimedia formats. I got very interested. Uh, uh, someone who'd been assisting me, a young photographer, Guillermo Landry, had inspired me to try using 360 degree technology, which at the time was used mostly by state agents to sell houses, to, as a way to more comprehensively explore the environments of people living with HIV. And I, with, with, with a bit of support from Brian, who gave me $5,000 to do this project, I began a collaboration with Treatment Action Campaign. And the initial idea had been to explore the lives of just a few people, um, some uh, with uh, people with AIDS, some who were, had access to treatment and some who didn't, and to try to explore, explore the meaning of that. Um, this photograph I took at the Treatment Action Campaign office in, in Johannesburg. Um, I went there with Viani, who was, who was working with me from the organization. We had, we had a, a pl- the plan was I was going to be meeting two or three people at the office, and we, I'd be making an arrangement to go back to their houses. Um, when I got to the office, there were 26 people waiting who all wanted to be part of the project. Um, and we agreed that um, we couldn't choose, we couldn't, you know, do beauty conscious and choose, so we decided to photograph all the people in the office and became an impromptu workshop and people kind of scribbled um, you know, signs onto uh, you know know, made those signs and and I'll I'll sort of, I'll I'll put the microphone down and just show you how, how we can Explore the photograph. So that's a full. That's essentially a full circle in the way it sort of folds out. Um, Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Was that picture p- widely published? Um, I mean, it's a very strong demonstration picture. If yes, you like, yes. I mean, I, mean, I think it's one, of my, it's one of my favorite pictures of this sort of genre. I mean, it was, wi- it was widely used. You know, I mean, it has been widely published and widely used. Um, I'll just show you another example of the way this technology works. Um, I'm going to make it too seasick. And I, I also made a series of films which were shown on Channel 4. They were, they were in, f- in fact shown on, um, you know, sh- shown on Channel 4 just before World AIDS Day that year. So, I mean, I think it did work as quite a potent tool and in, in, in a variety of dimensions. It was well published in The Guardian. It shows all the orphans and vulnerable children in that, in that village. And I'll, I've got a bigger file here which I'll dig into as well, so I'll give you a sense of it. I mean, presumably, it's actually very hard for most publications to use these pictures. Yes. I mean, they're almost in exclusively for use online because of the shape. Well, I mean... Um, I know The Guardian have done some where they ran, you know, they run them across a double page, but that leaves... Uh, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's actually Show the cover. Okay, 
there's, there's the cover. So you get this kind of tiny strip of the... <laughs> design sort of possibilities. It's, it's not impossible to be used. Mm -hmm. Do you want to use the mic, Gideon? Sorry. Sorry, Sorry that they're not impossible. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm just lacking a hand here, really. Uh -huh. OK, we get, no, we've seen, yeah. OK. Um, but most most publications would, yes, be, would, would uh, be. be put off entirely. Yes, definitely. So it, I, I probably don't always serve my own purpose that well. Sort of moving on from, from that, um, I, I'll show you a series of photographs which I did earlier on, which, which were also part of a very active um, collaboration with Treatment Action Campaign. And I, um, I developed this tool, which, again, I think these two photographs are its notable successes. Um, I didn't probably do it in, in, in a way that I, w that I would choose to now, but basically th this photograph over here, I took it as part of, I mean, I got the idea, I'll tell you the story. I was in Mozambique. I'd been commissioned by ActionAid and UNICEF, no, ActionAid and Oxfam to work on making a local educational exhibition about HIV AIDS in, in Mozambique. Um, and the, uh, one idea was to work with a local organization called Kindla Muka, um, which is a local organization of local HIV positive people. Um, but I got, I, I, I sat down in my first meeting with them and I explained what the project was and I explained that the photographs were going to be used and exhibited in Mozambique. And before I knew it, there was suddenly a huge fight raging in the room. People were shouting at each other in Portuguese and my translator explained that there'd been a misunderstanding that they thought the photographs were going to be used abroad. They, they, they weren't aware they were, they were going to be used within Mozambique and they were arguing about um, you know, who would be in the photographs. And they felt pressure to, to perform and kind of deliver people to, and be, to be photographed, but felt that they all had reasons why they couldn't be shown. Um, and when I realized what was going on, kind of instinctively without, kind of without even thinking about it, you know, I, partly just as a, as a professional to kind of get the job done, um, I knew I had to do something and I had to make some kind of intervention to save the day. And for... for for some reason, I, ha I had a, a roll of, of, gaffer, of, of, of gaffer tape in my, in my bag. Um, I sort of got up and addressed the group, and I, I sort of very self-consciously, ostentatiously um, made a square on the wall. And I said, look, here's, uh, 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 here's a frame. Um, I think we all agree that this is an important project, and there are a lot of important stories to be told. Um, what I'd like you all to do is put whatever you want to in the frame. No one has to show their identity. You can put, put, put whatever you'd like to in the frame as long as you tell me your story to go with it. And um, I, I just found actually that, I, I, you know, we, I, we, we agreed to, to meet again the next day and uh, people seemed to be really inspired by, inspired by that idea. And uh, I think I had unintentionally sort of empowered them in, in the group and, in, and engaged them in a way which they hadn't been engaged before. And some people chose to actually show their faces. Most people chose to put, put themselves and put, or put objects into the frame in different kinds of ways. Um, and um, that was the basis of, of a kind of a you know, big display in, in Mozambique. But I, I took the concept on and worked in South Africa with Treatment Action Campaign. And it, I actually I had a big exhibition of my broken landscape book, of, of my broken landscape black and white work in South Africa. At the same time, I began to make a new body of work with Treatment Action, action Campaign based on this idea. And it turned into something which was like di different kinds of combinations of words and photographs. Um, that, that, that works. So I can show you a few of the frames. Um, Each one of which yeah. works with a, with a, 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 a quite a long text. And so could we display one or two? I, I have some that we made. Us, basically, this body of work was also turned into... with in collaboration with Chris, we turned it into a, a very successful set of 13 posters. We, we made 500 copies of a 13 poster set, which were distributed to a variety of organizations in South, South Africa and Southern Africa, and are still being used in all kinds of contexts. And th it's quite a successful mini exhibition. Um, so it, we kind of created a, a sort of a, this is what I'd call a tool of visual advocacy. Um, Phil, can, can we? Sh should we look at them at the end rather than okay. look at them out now? Okay. 
Okay, we'll, 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 we'll display them at the end. I'm a surprise for you. Uh, was 31. She passed away two weeks ago. I can't remember when she started to become uh, sick. She she first had the tuberculosis, and after uh, after tuberculosis, she called for blood test, and she came with the results and uh, saying she was positive. She has a, a daughter. She is five. Her name is not uh, The days before she died, uh, she she was in bed all the time. She didn't even swallow water. If she swallows water, you, you, you can see in her, in her face that she was feeling pain. She was depressed, but she coped. I think uh, she, she, she would like to see uh, the treatment coming out and to save more lives. She really uh, loved her daughter, loved her family. She was a smart girl, all I can say. I think she she would uh, want uh, to get a treatment because she she, she have a, a, a young daughter. She was supposed to see her growing older and older. She was um, this girl who liked to talk. She has so many friends. She was open about uh, her status. Everybody in the community knew. People now are dying. I'm serious, they're dying. Like here in Township, we bury maybe four or five each weekend. When she was sick, she told, she told. Yeah, she move on, sorry about that. Maybe, maybe we can try and show no, another one of them later. Show, just show one more of the rotating panoramics. It seems to me these are really interesting because um, you, th the fact that you can see behind yeah. as well as in front of you, I mean, it's, that, that's where kind of all of the information is. At the same time, I would presume you got accused of being gimmicky um, for choosing um, strategies like this for, for storytelling. Um, or, or perhaps I, I'll rephrase that. Didn't, didn't, doesn't it seem to you even the danger of being gimmicky, the, well, the fact of the movement being the kind of the feature of the I, th I, th I think the work. danger, the danger is, is that this can become like a video game. You know, I think that is, um, but it, it does allow some quite interesting sort of explorations. And in a way, there, 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 there are 20 different photographs within each, within each of these in different, in different, different sorts of ways. And I mean, sorry, we haven't really got, the, we, the, uh, I think they do allow for some interesting um, stuff you know on a website. And we did a very interesting presentation of his work on the Guardian website, also with some hotspots where you could actually click on people and hear their voices within the frame. So I think there, there are lots of nice things which you know which can be done. Um, sh should we continue our backward chronology? <laughs> um, so I'm going to go from here into the kind of black and white phase. And in a way, this was perhaps one of the concluding images of my book. In a book that, by the way, I do have a couple of books for sale over here as well. This is the book which Chris, although he wasn't the publisher, he was the editor who I worked with. And I think Chris helped come up, you know, I think with making a kind of a coherent story and dealing with the kind of episodic nature of my work and the fact that there was, you know, lots of depth in some areas, not much depth in others. And I th I, I'm certainly very proud of this book, which has had a, you know, I think really does live on. It was published in Chris 2001. 
yeah. end of 2001, and you know it's still being used and it's still being utilized in all, in all kinds of ways. Um, and this, this this photograph was taken at the um, AIDS conference in Durban, the, the Breaking the Silence AIDS conference in, in in 2000, and I suppose it was just the point of that engagement and mobilization. The use of the, the HIV positive T-shirts in South Africa, I thought, was a great concept. Is in fact based on what happened in Denmark during the Second World War, when um, the Danish king, when, when Jews were all instructed to wear yellow stars, the Danish king said, "Well, all, all Danes will wear yellow stars." Um, and the idea in South Africa was, you know, everybody would wear HIV positive T-shirts and engage with and support people who are HIV positive, and as a way of combating stigma and fear. Um, and I think it's also connected with my earlier work because in the 80s, I, I photographed a lot of what they call the toy toy, the sort of the singing and the dancing of protest in South Africa. And I think one thing I learned in my experience in those years is that you had to, the noise and the sound of the toy toy is very hypnotic. And it often makes you think you've got great photographs, even if you haven't, because you know the, the sound and the, the rhythm hits you in the heart, hits you in the chest. Um, and I think my experience of kind of having to almost cut off the sound and focus on the shape and the form and the context. And I think it's always a challenge <coughs> working in AIDS and often working in very emotional, challenging, difficult situations is to be photographically calculating and making sure that one gets strong, powerful images is always a challenge. Um, and working backwards, this is a picture taken of someone called Florence Mobia in, in Uganda who was HIV positive and an AIDS activist. And... Um, Oh, there's a little funny story I, I can tell you. So I, two years ago, I went back. To, I mean, this was this was taken in, um, in fact, in two th 2000. It was one of my final project on the book. And when we're putting the book together, um, we kind of, in a way, the concept was to have you know the first two thirds of the book were about the problem, and the last third was about solutions. And we kind of felt, I think, that the solutions bit was a, was a bit weak, wasn't quite strong enough. And at that point, ActionAid had come on board as a sort of sponsor of, of, the, of the book. And I said to them, why don't I go and do some work, some more work in Uganda, looking, looking at solutions, looking at... Um, so Florence was one of the people who I photographed who had begun her own organization. And she was a rem remarkable woman. She was HIV positive and, you know, had a lot of children, was taking care of orphans, led a kind of a community program. So she was really a, shi a shining light. And I... Um, um, after I d I d um, did this project, um, ActionAid approached me, and they, they were actually sending sending a film star, a kind of well-known film star, to, to look at look at their projects in Uganda. And they said, "Well, you know, we're, do, do I have any, su any any suggestions?" So I said, "Well, why don't you take her to meet Florence?" Um, and um, I was back in the same area just two years ago. If in fact working three years three years ago working on, on on the memory box project and I went to a local Nakuola event and I bumped into Florence there and she saw me and she gave me a huge hug and she said thank you so much for sending that woman to me she's built me a house and she's sending my children to school <laughs> <laughs> and which is not necessarily something I, I approve of doing but it was quite an interesting <laughs> um, the problem was the kind of people I was photographing that point had huge expectations that I'd be able to, to deliver some similar kind of <laughs> <laughs> similar things which, which I wasn't really able to do. Um, this is the Reverend Gideon Biyamagisha who I photographed in Uganda as well. He also wrote um, the epitaph, the, you know, the, the, the end, end statement to my book and he's someone who's an interesting, challenging person. Kind of quite a strange story is that we both called Gideon and we're actually twins as well. We 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 born on the same day and same year. And he's one of the, he's one of the few openly HIV positive African priests. Um, that's a, um, a project helping with, with with AIDS orphans in Zambia. Um, this is a, was a remarkable kind of drama AIDS education project in 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 Tanzania in Pangani. Um, it's part of their performance. kind of condom demonstration again in, in Tanzania. This is a migrant hostel in South Africa and I'm, I suppose time is getting sh I'd like to leave space for discussion so I'm moving fairly quickly through these pictures. Um, 
that's a, a home care program, a place called Chicken Carter Hospital in Zambia, which helped sort of devise the concept of AIDS home care. Um, and it was actually an organization run by the um, Salvation Army. Um, and the Salvation Army was one of the churches which responded earliest and most appropriately in, in parts of Africa. And part of the reason for that is that they had, had a lot of experience of working with, with leprosy. And with leprosy, there's lots of very similar kind of challenges with stigma and fear. So they were kind of, in a way, quite well prepared for dealing with HIV and AIDS. Um, I mean, all of these photographs actually are, do go with quite substantial pieces of text and words. So showing them without the words kind of feels that you know, we are losing you know, quite, a, quite a big part of the experience. But um, you know, I'll allow you to, to, to read the book or look at, look at things online. Um, this is some work from a hospital um, in Zimbabwe. And that's, I guess, one of my best-known photographs of Joseph Gabriel being carried out of his house by his mother. Um, I, I, I just, I've always found this photograph has a very s kind of strong emotional impact for me. And just things like I love the, the, the plants and the flowers in the background. It gives a sense of care and, and order. Um, when I actually took this photograph, I, I, was, I was working with an organization in, 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 in a place called Mwanza, um, and they took me to meet the Bugarika Women's Association who were helping to care for various people in the community. And I was taken to meet a couple of patients. And Joseph was sitting outside his house. I went to meet him. I took a few photographs. And it was at the end of the day. And I, as I sort of we, I said goodbye, I walked away. And as we were walking away, I saw his mother lift him up and carry him into the house, which just kind of astonished me. And I saw that, and I sort of said, well, do you do that every day? And she said, well, you know, every morning I carry him out and every afternoon I carry him back and he spends the day sitting in the shade outside the house. And I actually, I had an arrangement to go to, 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 to another town across Lake Victoria that next morning. But I was going to be back in Wanzo a week later. So I made an arrangement to come back a week later, early in the morning, to be there when she carried him out. And that's what I did. I, I came back a week later and I was ready and waiting when she carried him out in the morning. And I think it certainly has been one of my I think one of my kind of strongest pictures, and a picture which is actually used in Africa for various reasons. It's a photograph I've lost control of, and it's being published all the time, and it's being used by very many organizations um, across Africa constantly. Um, that's a hospital. That's, in fact, the early morning drugs around in the TB ward at a hospital in Malawi. Um, it's at the same hospital, a mother and daughter who are both sick with AIDS. Um, and that's a photograph... There's, again, a long background and context to this photograph taken at um, Matibi Mission Hospital in Zimbabwe. Um, and he was one of the patients who had been photographing over a period of time in the hospital. Um, I was photographing his wife, lift him up, and as I was photographing, he had a kind of convulsion and died. It is So that's a photograph, perhaps the moment of death, or shortly after. And it, again, as a photograph that's quite controversial and has I've certainly been quite criticized for. Um, part of, I suppose it beca it's become a bit of a mantra story I tell all the time, and you may have heard it before, but um, Dr. Ashwandan, the Swiss doctor in charge of the hospital, you, you can see on the right there, um, when this was happening, I didn't quite know what was, what was going on, and he died. People around there, his family who were there at the time, began to kind of cry and wail and wail, and I, I sort of, m moments later after I took his picture, I put the camera down. And he just turned to me, and he was someone I, who I had a lot of respect for. And I, I suppose he was to some extent, to extent thinking in terms of his own needs, because part of the agreement was that I would provide him with a set of photographs to use for a fundraising tour he was doing of Europe. And he turned to me and when I put the camera down and said, come on, man, do your job. And I think what he was saying to me in some ways was in that situation, I wasn't a healthcare worker. I didn't have any role but to take photographs. Um, and he kind of reminded me to keep on doing it. Um, a series of photographs taken in Malawi from a, a funeral of someone from the M Mbawana family where a number of sisters and children from the same family had, had died from AIDS, AIDS-related AIDS infections. Um, this is a scene at a, a funeral of a young man who died from AIDS in Zambia. and. Um, just again in my last sort of anecdote, um, often one goes into a situation with something in mind, and 
um, in in lots of places in Africa, people have an all-night vigil before a funeral, and and in this event, there were about 60 people, friends, family, relations, sleeping around the house overnight. And I went and spent the night there with the intention was at dawn, when the, when, when the light came up, I would photograph everyone sleeping around the house. Um, so I spent a couple of hours through the, through the night awake, waiting to take photographs at, you know, when, when, when the light got there. And I took this photograph while I was waiting. Um, and what actually happened was, at the very, with the very first drop of light coming into the sky, the cocks began crowing, and everybody woke up and folded up, folded up, the, up their blankets and, and went away before I could actually take the photograph I planned to take. Um, partly because they didn't want to be a burden on the family to provide food, so they went all, all back to their back to their kind of houses to to, to, to get breakfast, basically. Um, so, but I had actually got this photograph while I was waiting, which I think for me is a very powerful erotic. Uh, Evocative photograph, and moving on to kind of the photograph which is on the cover of the cover of the, of the book of Broken Landscape. Um, it, it, I think it's again one of my most powerful photographs in this series. It's taken in the Shlabisa district of South Africa, um, and it's, when I took this picture, in fact, I took this picture a long time ago. I took it in 1991. At that point, HIV levels in the district were just 13 percent, 13 percent, one three. 30% of pregnant women, women were testing positive at that time. And at that point, I thought that was a horrifying figure. Um, right now, in the same district, the figure is just over 40%. Um, it's one of the highest levels of HIV prevalence in, in South Africa. So um, it gives an idea of how the disease has changed and um, you know where, where, things, where things are. Um, I mean, that's the end of this little presentation. I had, there are a couple of other things I could show to you if you're interested, but I think let's break now for some discussion. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Gideon. <laughs> You'd like to kick us off? Just raise your hand if you have a question. Jeez. Thanks, Gideon. Um, Ross O'Brien, uh, Friends of Treatment Action Campaign. Um, you've documented the struggles in South Africa for such a long time with Treatment Action Campaign, and everything's changed. Tabu and Becky's left. Um, treatment Action Campaign is, is a name that's known throughout South Africa. It's you know, a, a very, very strong movement, but they've always campaigned against the government, and now that's changed. And what, for you, what does what does that mean? What does that represent? Well, I mean, I, I certainly kind of hope to do some more work in South Africa in, in the near future. Um, I, you know, uh, Barbara Hogan, the new health minister, seems great, and she seems to be getting a really good team on board. So I'm, I'm very hopeful. I mean, I, th I, th I think the situation in South Africa is dire, and there are immense political, social, economic problems at the moment. Um, but I, I think. You know, Barbara certainly, you know, she's someone I know from the past, and I'm, I'm sure you couldn't have a better person driving driving the boat, although the boat's in pretty rocky water at the moment. Um, so in whatever, you know, so I would hope to develop a new project which could be supportive. I mean, to be honest, I'm, I'm kind of thinking of my next, you know, putting together another book. I'm actually in discussion with Chris about the next phase, and I, I have a vision of kind of, a final chapter, which would probably be in South Africa, and I mean, I, I think I'm looking for a way to maybe throw the camera back at the people, you know. So I, I would, I, I have, I, I in fact did quite an interesting project recently in Mexico. I'm, I'm involved with an organisation in based in Los Angeles, um, and we did a project in Mexico City where I worked with a group of HIV positive people just before the recent AIDS conference where I photographed them and they photographed themselves and it was pretty interesting and pretty successful and if we have time I could show you a, a, a snippet of that but I, I have a vision of perhaps going back and... I don't think we have work. time for you to show uh, snippets of anything, right, just a few so questions few and then we have to go. So, um, perhaps m m my vision is maybe to go back and um, work with some people who photograph themselves and photograph their own lives, may maybe, maybe children affected by HIV but I think it's time to do something kind of radically different and radically new. And I think that's the challenge for treatment action campaign. How do you move from being an opposition organization to being a supportive organization? I think it's, 
you know, and it's a question mark. You know, it's much easier to be in opposition than, than to be positive. And I think, I think that's a challenge we, we all face. For, the, for those who don't know, what, what the Treatment Action Campaign's purpose was to get uh, ARVs, uh, make ARVs available to all South Africans who needed them. Well, it, it wasn't initially it wasn't ARVs; it was appropriate treatment. You know, it's, you know, certain kinds that lots of appropriate treatment wasn't available. You know, treatment for thrush, treatment for, you know, symptoms of HIV and, and, and HIV. So it was trying to get appropriate treatment easily are, available. Are ARVs or other appropriate treatments widely available in South Africa now? It's pretty region, re regionally, with, with, with major regional variation. If you are in, Ca in the Western Cape, they're widely available and easily available. In fact, the biggest challenge, I mean, my sister is an HIV and AIDS doctor in Cape Town, and they have very good access to antiretroviral treatment. The problem is loads of people are still arriving, are coming in almost dead, coming in, trying to get treatment too late when the CD4 count is at a point where it makes it very dangerous to begin the treatment. And the biggest problem, really, there is stigma because they are not testing early enough, te they're not starting treatment early enough. So I'd say the biggest problem in South Africa is, is stigma, certainly in the Western Cape. Other parts of the country, the Northern Province, the Eastern Cape, have got pretty patchy and bad availability of, of, of ARV. So that's, I think, something, Barbara, that's the first challenge, is to roll it out properly you know, across the country. Are you, are you in agreement with that? At the back. Gideon, um, my name is Anne McFerrin. I'm a journalist, and I've worked with Gideon. And she's, and she's alive and not, <laughs> not, not, not too scarred. Okay. One of the interesting things about working with you is that I could tell intuitively whether you were going to take a photograph which was posed, which was usually a portrait, or whether you would take a photograph which was not posed. But I realized looking at your body of work that I don't really intellectually understand that, and I wondered if you had any guidelines, any rule of thumb, whatever, and it might be interesting for you to tell us a bit about that. About sort of when I make a portrait and... Exactly, but, and specifically in reference to, obviously, this, the, these thoughts were stimulated by your presumably slight run-in with National Geographic when that rather wonderful photograph of the family which, I mean, to me, who cares if it's posed or not posed? It looked like a fantastic photograph and very powerful. But I don't know what everyone else thinks here, but I would love you to talk us through that one. Well, I mean, I think, obviously, if you look at the black and white work, the, you know, my, my initial body of work, and the black and white work, which was done really in the 90s, kind of concluding in 2000, um, was, I suppose, very traditional photojournalism, I think quite strong. I mean, I think, you know, when I began, I was really driving it myself, you know, and often beating my head against a brick wall trying to get the work published. Um, and I gradually, you know, got the work seen. I think it, I was hugely helped by sort of winning awards like the Eugene Smith Award for Humanistic Photography and a World Press Award for the work. It helped get the work seen, get the work recognized. But I was very much photographing the, flow, the flux of life, being as inconspicuous as I could be, but um, generally not taking posed photographs. Um, and I think also, you know, when the book was published, I kind of felt I couldn't, I, either I had to leave the subject completely and find a new subject, but I thought if I was going to keep on working in the subject, I had to find new ways into it, new challenges. So, you know, the very next phase was going into, into the frame photographs, were often, which, which were often very posed, people looking at the camera in different kinds of ways. So, I think it was a movement where people were engaging with confronting the camera in a much more direct, very different kind of way. But I think it also coincided with me getting more involved in text and words. And, you know, bringing, you know so the first phase was kind of lots of words. And I don't know if you want to show with one of the posters and show, show the way the words were kind of co coming, coming into, into, into the production. No, no time. No, okay. No time. All right. Okay. Well, I created a set of posters which were as much about words as, as about photographs. And... Um, <laughs> I think it was partly about my changing engagement with the subject and my changing role and, I suppose, getting really mad and upset and infuriated about, about what I was seeing in South Africa, about, about what was happening, and just feeling that I, ha I had to do as much as I could and, and perhaps I, that ne I needed to change my role. Seeing an organization which I really felt inspired by and felt was doing something kind of wonderful. And I suppose I've always liked to fight. I've always liked being in opposition. I've always liked being, being you know, 
I suppose, I, you know, I, I've been called a loose cannon by different people, so I've always liked being a kind of a loose cannon and firing away. Um, and I think the portraiture helped that. And then there was, I suppose, changing. I have flip-flopped back and forth since, since then, doing some quite traditional journalistic storytelling, some very constructed portraiture. And I suppose I see myself doing that into the future, you know, moving back and forth in different kinds of ways. There's a question down here. Uh. Sorry. You mentioned a statistic about uh, in one area in South Africa where you had, when you first went there, it was 14% oh, incidents. Yeah. Yes, 13%. And more recently, close to 40%. I had heard a more harrowing stat when I was working in uh, Tanzania, also photographing women living with AIDS and helping to reduce the agony of AIDS, is that virtually only 5% of the population is actually tested for yeah. HIV. So if you think that 95% of sub-Saharan Africa has not been tested, what truly is the incidence? And of course, you know, one of the major uh, issues, as you discussed, and it's a, a reality that I don't think the West really understands, is stigma. And it's not just stigma amongst the ignorant and uneducated and poverty-stricken. It's stigma across the board, across every layer of the social fabric throughout sub-Saharan Africa. And although we have celebrated the worst kind of tarnished 25th anniversary a few years ago of AIDS, it is growing unabated, as I'm sure you have sure. experienced and, and witnessed, and as certainly as I have. And the tragedy is that, you know, when I speak to editors and so on, they say, oh, well, we've seen that. You know, well, people are bored with AIDS, and I'm in tears and I want to weep, and I say, children are suffering. There are people that are dying, and the world sits by, and a tragedy continues to grow uh, exponentially, and no one seems to care. So how do you make the world avail to the facts without making them angry in, in a way say, I've done that, I've been here. I mean, what's your, what's your approach to deal with this pandemic that seems to not really be under control? Well, I mean, I, th I think, I think the one, I mean, there, there, there are lots of things in that. I, mean, I think the one thing for me is, is I, th I think fighting stigma, I think I agree. Uh, you know, creating tools to fight stigma for me is probably the most important thing to do and, and I'm always you know very keen you know to make work which you know you know I th I, what, what I don't want to be is be a photographer who goes to Africa takes photographs and brings them back to the west and shows them here I think it's always been very important for me to make tools which can work and be used in different ways on the ground in the country you know so and you know I suppose to make I suppose what, you, what I've said before tools of visual, visual, visual advocacy and I think trying to fight stigma I'm, I'm actually in discussion with UNICEF at the moment about doing working on a kind of anti-stigma campaign which does sound you know potentially quite exciting but I think also in reference to what Anne said I think showing people with dignity show, portraiture is a way in a way you, you know I, I think you know getting away from people you know I think showing people's identity getting the, the kind of typical thing where people sh hiding people's faces, showing people in shadow, is very counterproductive often because that can really increase stigma and increase fear. So, fighting fear, fighting stigma, but I think also asking tough questions. And I mean, I, I've, my most recent body of work, which I just did recently in a place called Chirundu on the border of Zambia and Zimbabwe, I set out to go to a difficult place, a border post. Um, where is a huge, huge issue with sex workers, a place that's known as a HIV AIDS hotspot. And I set out to kind of ask difficult questions about why transmission levels are still so high. Um, um, if, if you, the, 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 someone in the audience called Katie Boot has been very helpful in helping to edit my interviews. And uh, th these are some of the, I mean, I think a lot of people might not be that happy to s read some of the things and see some of the things, pe hear some of the words of people, but I think it's quite important to, you know, do, you know, challenge people's preconceptions and get away from the ortho orthodoxy and not necessarily kind of try, trying to, you know, I think, Chris, you're right, at certain points I was quite guilty of trying to please the AIDS organizations, trying to do the right thing. Well, I and think it's... Uh, I will put it in, uh, uh, let me ask, because I think this is actually part of the same question. Isn't there a problem with the NGOs who have very concerned about issues of representation and um, need to, they need to put out a positive message, 
And actually, you've been a very, as it were, loyal participant within the NGO communication framework. Well, yes and um, no. And, and, and actually, the result is that people have got a very positive message. The, 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 the general understanding over here, I don't know about yes. anywhere else, is that actually it's kind of we're, the, the situation has been uh, uh, largely dealt with. ARVs are now available. Yeah. What's next? Y yes, I mean, uh, Chris, I, th I think I think that you can think of the kind of two extremes. You know, there's the, if, if you, I mean, if, 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 if you think of the kind of on the one extreme, there's the hardline journalistic view. People are sick. People are dying. There millions. The million. You, you must. You can take the, the extreme view, which is you should show suffering, you should scare people, frighten them. This is a terrible horror, it's a holocaust, it's an atrocity. Show the sick and the dying and the ill babies and you've got to show and shock people. If you take that as the one extreme view. And the other extreme view, which is the extreme, I suppose, organizational view, which is, you know, it's counterproductive to show that you've got the many positive stories, the many people who are HIV positive and are living rich and fulfilled lives and who are fighting the disease. You've got to show the heroes, show show the, the, the wonderful HIV positive kind of culture that's out there and the good work that's being done. If, if you take those two extremes, perhaps you can view my work as kind of a balancing act on the tightrope between those two points. Um, I think we've got time for t two last questions and then I think we're going to have to wrap up. Okay. With I mean, what, what I'll just show you what, while we talk is, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to read, read those, I'll show you... Um, this is um, the person whose words that, that's um, she's the person whose words those are that's I go ahead? yes Gideon um, was there a conscious decision at some point early on in your work uh, to stay with this theme because it's it's really hard especially when you meet resistance from editors who say you know we've seen this story many times um, and the tendency among a lot of photographers is to, you know, find the next story. Yeah. Uh, can you just talk a little bit more about that? Was it was it to do with your personal background or just um, getting into the? Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's it's a tough because it's, it's kind of been. It's, I've realised that it's, it's it's actually quite frightening. I've, I've been working on HIV in different ways for kind of fifteen years now, and kind of I think every year for the last fifteen years I have done some work on on the issue. Some years I've done a lot. Some years I've done you know. A couple of months of work. Some years I've just done, you know, a week or two. So I wouldn't say it hasn't been a consistent full-time occupation. But I, I have, over the last 15 years, done something every year. Um, and I, I suppose I am a bit of a stubborn fucker, and I, I, I kind of, um, you know, at times I've really been bounced back, and you know, at, at different points, you know different kinds of criticism and and, and, and certainly uh, the point has been expressed to me by people I've really respected in the photographic world that it's been the death of my photography that I was you know a great photographer in the 90s I was a you know I was a photographic star in the 90s and because I got so obsessed with the AIDS story it's kind of it's it's killed me as a as a as a photographer I mean that you know that that's you know that opinion is around um, I mean I mean to be honest I, I often kind of you know, think. You know, do I need? You know, do I need it as well? You know, why? Why do I keep? You know, keep an involvement. I mean, I suppose going just into my personal story. You know, my my, um, my both my parents were in different ways victims of, of the Holocaust in Germany. And my, my you know my mother was a refugee and lost a lot of fam family. My my father lost lost his parents in the Holocaust in Germany. Um, and I think all those kinds of contradictions of, on the one hand, being you know the child of German Jews and a victim and that a child of victims, but also growing up as a white South African and growing up in South Africa with all the privileges of, of being a white and the, the, maybe the contradictions of being, you know, a guilty white South African and a child of victims kind of makes me engage with, I suppose, this kind of modern day Holocaust in, in a long term sustained way. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a good question and, and I'm not quite sure of the answer, but there's a couple of thoughts. It's a good answer. Our, our last question. Thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure how you would describe yourself. Um, I, I, I guess no, it goes no, back no to your, your initial question of um, are you a photojournalist, are you a photographer? And I'm sorry to be so 
brutal and crass, but can a picture speak a thousand words? Um, I somehow feel closer to your pictures this evening from you speaking about them. And I guess what I'm getting at is how much is language necessary in order to to tell the story? And in a way, you've embraced that through this um, embracement of multimedia and, and the video works and sound recordings. But does that um, question your position as an image maker, or, or, or do you push that forward um, to embrace language as, and words as much as as, as these pictures themselves? Um, that, that is a very challenging and I think a very interesting question to kind of end with. Um, I, I, you know, you know I, I think dealing with an issue like HIV and AIDS, personal narratives are just are quite remarkable. And I think the stories people tell, for me, are always an amazing compliment to the photographs. And I do think a story like AIDS somehow does need that. And that's something which I find, I think it, they've really, the photographs have needed words to go with them. And I think bouncing the two off each other does often make, create something quite powerful. I mean, I, I, I actually am in the process of, and I have in the last couple of years, begun a new project trying to address issues around climate change. Um, and what I found over there is that actually personal narratives are not nearly as interesting around climate change because often one ends up asking people, trying to sort of get people to say things which they, they wouldn't naturally say because people, you know, I, I don't know, I, th I think it's often when people talk about HIV and AIDS, often people who are perhaps not that sophist sophisticated, people I've, I've talked to, have had to deal with quite challenging emotional, personal issues and have, have had some kind of tr transformative experience. And I think their words and their narratives are, I find, often quite remarkable. Um, so I, I think the words are really interesting. And, and I mean, I think often the challenge for me is to get people to read the words. You know, I, I think people's words, and I think working with sound is also really interesting, and uh, people's words together with pictures, that, that does provide l a lot of possibilities and a lot of quite exciting possibilities. Uh, yeah, yeah. Questions? insight into why she has half an eye missing or yeah. what her experience has been. And I think there are certain categories, as you well stated, and I know from my own experience, that you need the narrative. The narrative that that's, 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 that's what her question is. It's coming in as, as a photographer. Com sorry, because so there's a... There's a sorry, I, I guess I'm just questioning, uh, coming at it as a photographer, sure. primor primarily a picture maker, what purpose or what power does the image have without that added narrative? You know, I, I, I feel so much closer to your pictures from coming this evening and hearing you speak and, and hearing sure. this discussion through the language and, and, and the narrative than if I'd just seen them in The Guardian in the weekend supplement. Sure. So. Um, yeah. and, and I mean, I think you know, ideally, that's also the function which books and other kind, other uh, other kinds of works, multimedia work. You know, is, is, I mean, I think obviously a publication in a newspaper is often a very limited, a limited, limited thing. And you know, hopefully, when I get to do my next book, I'll have the place to really portray my work in, in the way that I like to. And I think there's also an interesting film I could make with putting together a lot of the multimedia and the photographs. Um, but I do think, actually, it's a question I face, and, and I think perhaps I need to go. M my journey in the next, in the coming years, is perhaps to go back to image making and refine my image making because I do fundamentally want to be a photographer and an image maker and an artist most of all. Um, you know, I don't ultimately want to be a journalist or a purely an activist. You know, I think. What I do best is actually making images, and that's what I, that's, that's, and, and, and I, for various reasons, I've, I, and good reasons, and I think it's, I had done an interesting work with text and words and sound, but image making is what I most want to do. And I don't want to be a video maker either, I want to be a maker of powerful photographs. And I'll, I'll just take you through.
take you through a few of these pictures from Chirundu. Well, 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 it's obviously going to be impossible to stop Gideon tonight. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you <laughs> Look, Show the pictures while we're yeah. thanking yeah, you. Yeah, while we're thanking you. Just, 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 just a couple of the... Oh, when are they, do we well, have a publication um, date? We don't have a publication date, but it's probably going to be in The Guardian sometime in the coming month. It was going to be Saturday, but it's been... The Weekend it's, Magazine. But, no, it was going to be in the paper, actually. Um, and this is, again, just a journalistic piece looking at life in a small town on the border. Um, dealing with sex workers and truck drivers and a really one of the worst places in the world to spend 10 days. And the, the, the words are a very important part of it, as Katie well knows. Okay. Well, you've been very open and uh, about your strategies and your approaches to... Uh, to your work, your, the limitations of them as well, and uh, perhaps that's obscured at some points the power that the work has had. I know that from my own experience, and I know that from other journalists who've worked with you or I've heard from about the work. I've seen how you work with NGOs, not just as somebody who delivers a certain message, but providing them contacts, connecting people uh, you encounter in your work with NGOs who, who can then support what they're doing on the ground. And it's a pretty amazing endeavour. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to add that and say thanks for this evening. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Thanks, everyone.